So next speaker is me. It's a little bit weird introducing myself, but uh, essentially I'm, uh, for those who don't know, I'm a chiropractor. I'm also the clinic director at Seven Oaks and Beckham Chiropractic Clinics, and I run patient-centered training where I've been helping clinicians get better results with their patients through ethical and effective communication strategies. Um, that's my elevator pitch there, essentially. And um, I've been working for a number of years on this. And one of the things we're going to talk about today is a really key concept. I'm going to share the screen here called the story circle. This is something I've been focusing on more and more in the past year or so. It's a really great way to actually get better results with patients and to build your practice. It's, this is what I love about ethical communication is that it can be a win-win. Your patients do better and you do better. It doesn't have to be this myth of, Either you do really well and the patients suffer because you're not giving great care, you're over treating, or the patients do really well, but your diary is fine. It can be a win win there. So, we're going to talk about this in a couple of different contexts today. First of all, though, I just wanted to share a little story about why we talk about stories because I'm generally quite a fact based guy. I'm quite logical, I'm quite left brained, I'm quite analytical. And certainly early on in my career, I would try to persuade people or try to convince people or try to illustrate things to my patients using facts. And facts are great when they're used to back up something, but they're not particularly good for actually convincing people. Because what we need to do when we're trying to persuade somebody or try to sway them is we need to speak to the emotional brain. The emotional brain can't interpret facts. What it loves is stories. And in fact, to illustrate this really quickly, an example, I, uh, as a patient of mine, I was chatting about when I first put together my first online course. Um, and he'd been doing this for a little while. And he's, he's worked in real estate coaching. He's, you know, he's been doing this stuff for a long, long time. And we were chatting about it. And he said, you know, you should bring stories into it. And he said, look, here's a little example. He said, my, you know, his son, um, when he was younger, had a bit of a problem with staying dry through the night. He was wetting the bed. And he was a little bit old for it. And obviously his son felt really embarrassed about this. And it got to the point where he didn't want to go and spend the night at any of his friends' houses. He, he wouldn't go to sleepovers and things like this because he was so afraid it would happen. And he'd be really embarrassed and all his friends would laugh at him. And my patient noticed that he would drink a big glass of water right before he went to bed. And he tried telling him, he said, look, Tim, if you don't drink the water before you go to bed, then you won't need the loo in the night. You'll be able to stay dry kept telling him, kept telling him, wasn't getting any, wasn't making a difference. And then he suddenly realized that he needed to take a bit of his own advice. So one day he goes to Tim and he goes, you know, I heard about a, a boy just like you had a problem staying dry through the night recently. And he, he found a solution that really worked. And Tim went, oh yeah, what's that? And he said, well, he was, you know, struggling like you were and he didn't want to go to his friend's houses. He was worried his friends were going to laugh at him and he was getting really upset about it. He was getting really stressed out because he felt really embarrassed. And he realized that if he tried not to drink water in the evening, he stayed dry through the night. He tried it one time and suddenly it didn't happen. And ever since then, he's gone, OK, I don't drink any water after dinner. And he stays dry through the night. And now he can go to his friends' houses and he can, he can go to sleepovers and things like this. He's not worried about his friends laughing at him. And he's having a lot more fun. And he just mentioned that story and left it. And lo and behold, Tim's getting ready for bed, goes, brushes his teeth, puts on his pajamas, doesn't drink any water, goes to sleep, stays dry through the night, has never had a problem since. And he had tried for weeks and weeks and weeks to illustrate it with a fact when all he needed was one simple story. And he told me this to illustrate the power of telling stories. And I'm now sharing it with you to illustrate the power of telling stories with improving our practices as well. So I love this story because there's about three layers of just retelling it. One story can have a, a big effect in a number of different ways. And by using that in my first course, I, the feedback was much better, actually. When I started doing it, a number of people were commenting, going, oh, these stories are great. And they really helped me put it into practice. So we're going to talk about stories today, how we structure them, but how we use them to improve our practice as well. And there's three key ways you can do this. You can do this with your patients through the patient journey. We're going to talk a little bit about that. You can do this through your marketing as well. It's a very powerful way to actually market your practice effectively. And you can do it to empower your team, whether you're like Rosie and you have 16 clinicians, whether you have one associate, whether you just have a front desk CA, 
whoever it is that's on your team, you can use it to empower them to actually grow and improve and become even better clinicians, even better product desk team, so that your whole practice thrives. And it's not just on you having to do all the work to drive it. Before we do that, I want you for a moment just to imagine for a second that you're a patient. Let's say you're a patient, like Rosie mentioned, with migraines. You've been getting these migraines, they've been getting worse, they've been getting worse. They're stopping you from doing the things you love. They're stopping you from going out and spending time with your friends. There's maybe some activities, goals you want to achieve. But this pain has been getting worse. And a you know, family member says, oh, I knew somebody had migraines. They went to see a chiropractor. They went to see an osteopath, whoever it was. And they go, they, are, they got, had some treatment and it got way better. So you decide, okay, well, I'm going to go and find somebody. And if you're like 99% of people, the first place you're going to look is Google. And you go on Google and you have a look and you go, oh, there's some few clinics in the area. You know, one's got three stars. Well, I won't look at them. This one's got 4.8. That's pretty good. I'll have a little look. And you read the reviews because you want to see, can this person help me? You're not really interested in whether they can do other things. You're really looking for, is this going to help get rid of my migraines? And you see this review, this is an example, um, one of our patients who left it a while ago. It says, very friendly and professional staff, clean premises, easy parking, five stars. That's great. Like those are good things. And certainly if you don't have clean premises or your staff aren't friendly, that's going to put patients off. And it's five stars, which is nice. But that doesn't really answer this question. Now, I've taken the patient's name off because I wouldn't want them to think we're not grateful for the review. We genuinely are. However, this doesn't really help that person see what's going on. Whereas this is an example, actually, who a uh, patient who saw Rosie. And she says a little bit more. So this is why I came in. She was very knowledgeable, sorted out my SPD. I'd seen other people and they hadn't been able to do it. And she could also help with my migraines too. They're much better. Now you're looking at this going, okay, wow, Rosie can help with migraines. That's the problem I had. And also she gave me advice for training during my moonwalk this year. I wouldn't have been able to complete that without her. So not only is this somebody who can help with my migraines, but they can help me do the things I love to do, like Rosie was talking about. And if you're somebody who had, let's say, a shoulder issue, reading this is not going to put you off. You're not going to go, oh, clearly Rosie can only sort out migraines, especially because this one talks about other things as well. But if you can see yourself in that story, because this review tells a little story, it's going to be much, much more engaging. So when you're asking for Google reviews, when you're looking to build that, you really want to help patients understand what to do. Now, I'll share in an email afterwards with everybody. Um, I put together a little strategy for how to get more Google reviews. And I also include how to request them so patients know to do that, because we were getting some like this, much more powerful if we can turn them into a review like that. And that's what stories can do. Stories are much more powerful. It's going to really engage that patient a lot more. They're much more likely to choose you and decide you're the person they're going to go and see to try and get help with their migraines. So what is the story circle? Well, this diagram here illustrates how the story circle works. Now, the story circle is based on the hero's journey. If any of you are familiar with Joseph Campbell, he wrote very influential books called The Hero's Journey. Another one was The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Joseph Campbell was an anthropologist and he went around the world to as many different cultures as he could. And he studied their myths and their stories and their legends. And what he found was that when you zoomed out and looked at them, we all keep telling the same story. It has the same framework. It has the same sort of arc and progression. And stories are so ancient, the earliest signs of civilization we have, you know, cave paintings on walls that go back 50, 100,000 years. They're telling stories. You can look and you can see the animals, you can see the people, you can see the hunt, you can see the, the kill, you can see what happens afterwards. Storytelling is really, really ancient. And there's some good evidence that we're actually wired now to understand stories. It's been such a key part of our evolution. And this structure is something that gets carried in all the same you know, religious myths, all the same ancient myths, modern Hollywood movies, the Marvel movies, Star Wars, Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, you know, all these books, they fit this structure. And when a story doesn't fit this structure, it doesn't get remembered. You know, there are movies that have tried to play with this. And if you stray far from the structure, 
they just flop. It doesn't really work because we're looking at it and going, that doesn't make sense to me. So it's important that we use this structure. Now, the story circle is a bit of a simplified version. Story circle was developed by Dan Harmon. If you've ever seen the TV show Community, he created and wrote that. Very good show. Also, Rick and Morty, which is a very popular one now. He wrote that. And he uses this for every single episode of every single show, and every single movie he's ever written. And it's a really good way to understand how we can use this for our patients as well. So you imagine this circle and there's eight points in the story circle. We're going to simplify this a bit more, but just briefly to go through them. It starts with you, the hero, the person at the top. And there's some sort of need. So you go around the circle, you identify there's a need, you need something, something's missing from your life. So you go and you search for it and you look for it. And then eventually you find what it is you most need. You take that, but you, not, you pay a heavy price. There's some sacrifice you have to give up. Then you return back to where you came, but you've changed. That is a satisfying story to read. Any book or movie that you've ever read will be trying to follow that. But it's important for our patients as well. So we can think about this in a patient-centered context. The you is our patient. It's not us. We are not the hero in their journey. They're the hero, but we get to help them. So they will have a need. This person is getting migraines. They're getting SPD. They search. They look online. They found Rosie. They spoke to Rosie. She found the problem. She gave her guidance and her expertise. There was a solution. They took it. They had to pay a price. They had to have some treatment. They had to maybe you know, turn up for visits. There was a time cost to it. They maybe had to change certain lifestyle things, do certain exercises. But they returned back to the life that they had, having changed. Now there is some sort of knowledge, some sort of skill. They've brought something back with them. And the change part is really, really key, because if there's no change, it's a pointless story. If Luke Skywalker went around the galaxy, defeated Darth Vader, all this stuff, and then he goes back and just you know, lives in the desert on his own for the rest of it, has nothing to do with the rest of his life, nobody's going to find that story satisfying. So the change is really, really key. Now that change might be they're better equipped with some tools. Maybe they know how to prevent this from happening in the first place. Maybe they're stronger. Maybe they've done some exercise. Maybe they just know that there's somebody out there who can help them. And the next time this happens, they know who to see. They know they're in good hands. So they have that reassurance. That's the story circle that our patients want to go through. So if we break this down, when I'm recommending a course of care for patients, I'm going to use this same structure. When I'm explaining after the examination, the report of findings, the recommendations, conversation, whatever you call it, the first bit's the history. So everything up until they come in to see me, I'll recap that. So the patient was doing well, and then they started getting these migraines. These migraines started getting really debilitating. They stopped them doing the things they loved. There's a need there. Now they need to get back to the things they love. And they realized it wasn't going to go away. So they went out into the world. They went into the unknown world of healthcare. And if you think of this story circle divided from the top half and the bottom half, the top half is when they're in the known world. They know where they are. They know what's going to happen. Things are predictable. The bottom half is the unknown world. This is their sort of venturing out the village into the woods for the first time. Think of it that way. So they go into this unknown world. They have to start thinking about who they're going to see, who can help them, how are they going to solve this? And they search, they look online, and they find somebody who they think can help. Maybe they've had to search a while. Maybe they've tried two or three people that couldn't help. But hopefully they find that person. And then they go to see them, and together they do an examination and they find the problem. This is what your examination is. You're trying to find what's going on, the reason why this person can't get back to the things they love, the thing that's stopping them doing what they want to do. And when you find that, you'll have an idea of what the solution is. So they will have to take action. There will be a price they have to pay in terms of treatment, in terms of time, in terms of different activities, whatever it might be. But at that point, when they take and then they can return to the known world, that's their care. So when I am talking to a patient about the plan, I'm going to use this exact structure and I'm going to tell it in this order because this is the way patients will remember it. So this is what was going on. This is where you are. He's getting these problems. It's stopping you do the things you love. You were getting really fed up with it. 
So you came in to see me and we searched together. We found this issue in your examination. We found this joint, this muscle, this nerve. And we realized that's the problem. That's what's stopping you from getting where you want to be. And now we're going to take action. So I'm going to recommend these visits. I'm going to recommend this cell care. I'm going to recommend whatever it might be. That over time is going to return you back to where you were. It's going to get rid of this issue. So you're feeling better. You can be doing all the things that you love and you won't have to worry about this coming back. You'll be changed and you'll be better than you were before. So not just pain relief, but doing the things you love to do feeling more confident and not worried about this in the future. Doing that is much more effective than trying to get into really technical descriptions of what your treatment is going to do and how it's going to make changes to these joints or these muscles. You can add that in if that's relevant for that patient. Some patients, if they're quite analytical, may want to know that. But the majority just want to hear this story and understand that you are the expert who can help them, but that it is their story. You're going to get them back to when they want to be. What you don't want to do is make yourself the hero and talk about you're going to go on this quest and you're going to find these things and you're going to overcome them. You're going to take action. You're going to get the patient, you know, the passive damsel in distress back to where they want to be. Don't make it about yourself. It can be really easy to do because we're all really into what we do. That's, that's why we do this. We love the fact that we can help people with our hands and all our knowledge and expertise. But we have to remember that it's really about the patient. So an example I often use here is the Lion King. If you think about in the Lion King, Simba had a need. He was going to be king one day, but his father dies and he doesn't know what to do. So he goes out on this quest. He goes to try and find it. He hangs around with a meerkat and a warthog who kind of distract him and teach him to be lazy. Doesn't really go very far. But then Rafiki, the, the witch doctor, the monkey comes in and he knocks him around the head. He, he whips some sense into him. He has this vision of his father, realizes what he needs to do. He needs to go back and face his uncle, return back to the Pride Lands, take action, pay a heavy price, face his greatest fear. And then when he does that, he's changed. And at the end of that story, now he is the responsible king. He's realized being a king is not about bossing people around. It's about taking responsibility for everybody else. Your role in that story is to be Rafiki. Now, you may be with them through that journey. You may be with them a bit longer. Rafiki's there at the end. But it's not to try and be the hero. So that's the way that we can use this with our patients. Another way with patients is you can use this if you want to try and get them to do something, maybe encourage them to make a change in their behavior they're not necessarily on board with, is you can talk about another patient you did this with. So, for example, I, I had a patient fairly recently where I was trying to get them to look at their diet, and it was quite clear they were eating a number of things that seemed to be flaring them up, but they were kind of not really on board. You know, you're a chiropractor, just crack my back, why are you talking about diet? And so I shared this story of another patient who had a problem similar to theirs. This was the history. They had this need. We tried various things. Eventually, we found that bread and pasta were really flaring them up and that when they took those out they got way better and it was so much more effective than any treatment we were able to do just with our hands it made a big big difference there so this was this whole story circle again and now they're doing much better they can do the things they love they're not having to see me very often you know they're feeling so much better that is a much more persuasive way to encourage a patient to take action than trying to explain the technical specifics of how you know somebody with a gluten intolerance is going to be flaring up their joints through inflammation. That's helpful to add in, but you've got to have the story first. Speak to the emotional brain, and then we can add some knowledge to the technical brain as well, to the more logical brain. So that's how we can use this with patients. What about marketing? Marketing, we want to be using the same thing as well. So when you are putting together your website, when you're putting together posts, if you want to encourage people to come and see you to help with something, first, you have to identify the problem. So you would share the problem that your ideal patient is facing, that they have this need, they've been searching for something. And what we need them to see is that you can search and you can do things, but eventually you'll need to take action. And in this case, the action would be coming to see you meet the guide and together you will find the source of the issue, find out what it is they need to get better so that they get this result, they get back to what it is they want. And you can do that in very simple ways like Rosie was sharing, you know, your mission statement, your elevator pitch is a very small example of that. 
Reviews and testimonials can be doing that as well. Any of the copy on your website can be doing this, but you want to talk about problems your ideal patients face, and then the fact that working with you will help them get the result, these problem solution sets. So this is where you're struggling. Come and see us and we'll help you get back to this result. And you'll see the action, it's a relatively small part of it. You don't go into a lot of detail about what it is you're necessarily going to do at this stage. It's really about speaking their language, talk about the problem so they can resonate with it. They can go, oh, that's me. That's going to engage them. And then talk about the result, the thing that's going to happen once it's solved. So they can go, yeah, that's what I really, really want. So they know you understand where I'm at right now and you understand the result that I'm after. So if you want to learn more about this, there's a very good book called Story Brand. Story Brand is a similar structure to this as well. So you identify your target patient. They have this need, something they want. They are going out to search for it. They meet a mentor who offers a plan that leads to success and avoids failure. Now, I don't like to really use failure as a big way to motivate people over and over, but it is something that you can talk about with patients because there's already a fear there. So you may say that this is going to help you do this and not get stuck, put up with this pain over and over and have it really get you down. You're not drilling into like how bad it's going to be if they don't, but you're speaking to a fear of theirs that's already there. So the result can be doing something great or it can be avoiding something scary, avoiding something they don't want to do. But using the story circle can be a very powerful way of marketing. It's much better than talking about yourself a lot on the website. It's a lot better than going into specific, you know, so many chiropractors have pages and pages about what an adjustment does, you know, the approach chiropractic takes, all that sort of stuff. Most patients don't really care. And the ones who might care don't care until they know you can help them. Remember, your marketing should be answering the question, can you help me? Talking about how chiropractic works doesn't answer that question. So if you're not getting this element in and you're not using good story circles for that, all that other stuff is going to fall flat. It's, it's a typical thing we do in chiropractic where we spend a lot of time talking about what we want patients to know about chiropractic, but we don't really start talking about what patients want to know, which is can you help me? Now, the third way you can do this, you can use this with team empowerment as well. So if you've got an associate or you've got a team member, this is something you can go through periodically and use their story circle. I came across this with Joe and Steve Davidson, talk about this a lot in their programs. And it's a really great way, and it's again, based on the story circle hero's journey to help empower them to take more responsibility, to take more ownership, to grow, help achieve things so they can do better. And you all grow as a team member. Now, I do this with our team a couple of times a year. I'll sit down one-on-one -on -one with each team member. Also, if somebody seems a little bit stuck, if they seem like they're a bit frustrated or something's not going well, I'll sit down and go, hey, let's do a story circle. Like, let's, let's talk through this a bit. So in this case, what you would do is, first of all, you get very, very clear on where they're at now. What's their current reality? So they can look at that and go, where are you at now? And this might be getting some objective measures. It might be, the hours they're working, the pay for a clinician, patient numbers, the amount their diary is full. And then you can look at some of the more experiential emotional metrics. So how confident they feel, you know, how stressed they feel. Do they feel that they're lacking in something? You know, I will ask them, where do you rate yourself out of 10 on certain skills like communication, manipulation, rehab, adjusting, whatever it might be. Get really, really clear on exactly where they're at now. So by the end of that, they'll go, yeah. That's where I'm at right now. Then in this case, I skip ahead and I don't go to the second step. I'll find out what's your goal because we're trying to find out what their story is. Where do you want to be? If you don't know this about your team members, then it's very hard to know if you're all on the same boat. Like Rosie was saying, you might have different goals and that's fine, but can you get an alignment for the journey? So you want to find out what their goals are longer term. Now, that could be you know, six-month goals, 12-month goals. I wouldn't go into five, 10-year goals. We're getting into life coaching territory a bit now, maybe. But find out what they want the next year to look. And you, it's really a compare and contrast. The same questions that you've asked them about where are you at now. We're trying to find out where do you want to be. You know, when you're at that eighth step, when you've gone through the story circle and you're changed and your life is better than it was before, what's changed? What's different? What's your life looking at? Maybe they want to start working with a different type of patient. Maybe they want to go and upskill, learn a new technique. 
make whatever it might be. So you find out where are they at now and where do they want to be? And then we need to look at the obstacles. So then I would say, right, what is it that's in the way? And as much as possible, I would want the team member to actually come up with these themselves. I don't want to go, right, here's your problem. This is where you are, this is where you want to be. And these are all the things you've got to change because it doesn't really work well when it comes externally. So we want them to identify what are the barriers to getting them there? What are some of the actions that they need to take? What are some of the things that need to happen? And you can go through that together. You may have some observations, but I would certainly to empower them, try and share it after they've shared theirs. And I generally will say, okay, I can think of one or two things that might be important to address to get you there. I can share them if you'd like. So I ask permission. And then I'd share them and go, what do you think of those? To find out if it's landed or if not. But at the end of this, now we can look at it and go, okay, we know where you're at. We know where you want to be. We know what's got to change to get you there. So we can sit down and work out a plan. And this may be looking at maybe there's a couple of key obstacles, like, for example, improving their communication skills might help less patients dropping off. That might help improve their numbers. That might help improve their confidence. That might help improve their results with patients. Look for a couple of things where you can see, you know, addressing this one is going to help a few of them. And then you can rank them in priority. You can go, right, what's the most important of these two things? And this can be a discussion that you both have. So at the end of this, they can see their stories up. They can see the path they're on because often they feel stuck because they can't see the woods for the trees. They're kind of wandering around in the mist. They don't know where they're trying to get to because they haven't really visualized their own goal, which means they're frustrated no matter what they do because they don't know where to head. You know, you're lost in the woods. You might be heading in the right direction. It doesn't matter because you're second guessing yourself all the time. And what they've seen here is that you've taken an interest in them. So this is an associate centered conversation, if you will. It's about them saying, okay, you really want to help me achieve my goals rather than you telling the, the team member or the associate, here's where you should be. A bit like if you said to a patient, here's my goals for you, it's not going to work for you. So same idea, same story circle, but you're using it to help empower your team as well. So those are three areas that we can use this in. We've got the patient journey, we've got using it for marketing and outreach, speaking to patients, speaking their story so they can recognize themselves in it and empowering the team as well. So that not only, it's not just you having to push everything and tell everybody what to do, but you can find out where they're at, you can find out what they want and show that you're interested in helping them get there. They'll be much more on board with your recommendations when they can see you care about where they want to be, not just you trying to push them where you want them to be and then kind of dragging their feet. If you encounter that kind of resistance, then you, that's where you can start to find that often there's a need to identify their goal. Maybe they don't know what it is, or maybe they just haven't had that chat with you. So very quickly, Oh, let's bring this back up. I just want to go through the three R's for effective stories as well. So these are three things that you've got to make sure are working for the patient and working for that story if you're going to use them well. If you don't use these, it won't land and it won't work. So the first one is they have to be relatable. So if you're going to use an example of somebody who is a 23-year-old athlete, that's maybe not going to be relatable to a 63-year-old grandmother or a 52-year-old CEO who doesn't like exercise. So try to pick examples and stories that can relate to them. Obviously, with the marketing, you want it to be relatable to your ideal patient. We want to make sure that we, we find that out. So when you're using stories to illustrate points, make sure it's relatable to that person. Also, make sure the story is relevant to them. So they have to be able to see themselves in it, but they also have to see how this story is going to help them get something that they want. If they can't see the relevance, if I use an example of somebody changing their diet and it helped them you know, sleep better through the night because they weren't getting inflamed and waking up a lot, that's not relevant to somebody who goes, yeah, but my goal is I want to be able to like go for days out with my family. So as well as relatable, they can see themselves in it. It's got to be relevant to their goal. And lastly, they have to be realistic. And this is realistic in the patient's eyes. So you can tell tall stories, you can tell these amazing things. If the patient doesn't think that's realistic, it's not really going to work. So when you're thinking of a story to illustrate a point, make sure that you get those three in. Relatable to the patient, they can see themselves in it. Relevant to them and their goal. And realistic, that they're going to be able to see, okay, I think I can get there. 
you know, if, if you talk about how they achieve this by doing 45 minutes of working out every single day, you can understand some patients go, oh, okay, they were like me and they got where I want to be, but I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. So using those three will make it much, much easier to use those stories, particularly with helping patients, but using those examples to help your team as well and speaking to prospective patients out there when you're monitoring. All right, I think we're okay for time. If we've got any questions, I'm happy to open things up there with everybody. Um, let's stop sharing the screen for a moment. Um, that was really interesting, Chris. Like I was, do, do you, when you start doing this, do you feel a bit silly because you're telling a story or does it just come naturally? That was what I was thinking. Like, it can feel a little silly at the start sometimes. You can go, does this seem like professional? You know, you're like, I'm going to tell a story. Depends how you introduce it. I wouldn't say, all right, sit down, let's let's tell you a little story. Um, but I'll start it with, you know, I can be like, you know, I, I saw a patient similar to you once and they were having this kind of issue and this is where they were struggling and this was their need and this is what we found and this was the change that happened for them. So, you know, it does, it's often, I'm usually doing it while I'm treating. I'm not really sort of sitting them down and having this conversation face to face. They're often on the bench while I'm doing that. And then I'll sit them up and you can kind of see how it's landed if they have some questions so if there's more of a follow-on we might do that um but usually it's i'm kind of doing it as a little throwaway thing i'm almost going like i'm making conversation it seems to go in a bit better that way um yeah so if, if you were to sort of sit down and formalize it it could seem a bit stilted but okay just doing a small talk works quite well i think okay and question here would you consider using examples of anonymized patient story circles on your website strike social media for marketing in order to engage new patients more effectively yes definitely um the best is always is if you can get um some sort of testimonial like just screen grab a google review if they do that if a patient's willing to sit down in front of a camera that's really powerful but it's a more of an ask than them just reading a review but certainly you can use these stories on your social media. You can say, you know, here's a really interesting case we saw recently, a person was struggling with this. This is what we found. And now they're able to achieve X, Y, Z. With that, what I would try and do is don't make it all about how we found, but they need to see me and I'm so great. You, know, you can mention they came in for treatment that was helping, but I would try to mention something that might be useful to a prospective patient. So we found that actually, you know, part of getting them better was looking at the way they sat at their desk in the time. And by changing that, that actually helped make a difference for them. Because that way, the message is, here's some knowledge you can use right now. You can go on this story circle on your own immediately. That will build trust. And then if they think, okay, that's help that I need more. Oh, I'll go see that chiropractor. Yeah, they really seem to know what they were talking about. Um, but certainly, I would use these out in your marketing and anonymized ones are great because you can pick which ones are relevant for your patients too. Um, it's always better if you can get the patient's name on it, but for confidentiality and things like that, that's a really quick and easy way to start. And then someone else asks, when you talk about stories in marketing, would you share this as a video on social media? Yeah, I mean, I would. I'm quite comfortable in front of camera, so I'm happy doing that and recording that. If you are great, um, if you're not, you can do it in text. You can do it in a blog post. Um, I would say find the medium that works best for you. My bias is towards video because I'm really extroverted and I like talking. Um, and I find typing a little bit too slow. But if that's outside of your comfort zone, then find something that works better for you. There's many different ways to reach people. And people engage differently. Some people prefer text. So... Like if I'm sort of flicking through social media, I very rarely watch videos. I like to I like to put them out there, but I don't I like to just kind of read. I don't want to be blasting stuff out of my phone all the time. So um find it that works for you, but it doesn't have to be a video. You'd be quite good at the one of those posts that you know that you slide through that you have to go to, you have to sort of, you know, you keep going and in the next slide oh, there's something else. Yeah. Like a carousel one. Carousel, that's what that might be really because you could tease each bit. Yeah. That's a really good way because you can do a little foreshadowing on each of the slides as well. That would work. Really well. A person saying they like video, they're not ext extrovert too. So, like, if you like video, it could be a really good reel or something like that. Just talking to camera, you don't have to point and dance, but just telling the story. You can get it in in a minute or ninety seconds, and that'd be yeah, good. I mean, you can even use the story circle. You could do, you know, you could go through that structure and go, here's one for each each slide, or go through the three phases. Um, yeah. Then yeah, it's because once they start to see there's a bit of a story that instinctively hooks us. We want to hear like, oh, what's going to happen next? 
Someone else says, I've tried using stories, but feel stupid as I'm going through the story. Okay, it might be that you're you're maybe putting a bit too much pressure on the story. You might be trying to make it a bigger thing. Like I say, if you were to just pick an example that was you could kind of use as a throwaway. So like I use one with, um, and this is a nice way to introduce maintenance care if it's relevant. If I had a patient who um, plays a lot of golf and is gets really competitive, I think he plays with his brothers and they meet a couple of times a month. And I think they put a fair bit of money on it. They're all really competitive into this. And so he now for a while has been coming to see me a week before. He'll come in for a maintenance visit to make sure everything's on top form to give him the best chance of winning. Um, I throw that in with patients if they play golf because it's got to be relevant to them. I can use that as a story to introduce the concept of maintenance without saying, right, you need to have maintenance care or you should have maintenance care or here's an option for you. I'll just tell that story. I'll say, you know, oh yeah, I see quite a lot of golfers here. Some of them get really competitive. I've got this one patient who does this, this, this. You know, I'm, I'm just telling them something like, oh, here's a funny thing I heard. The other day. So yeah. it can be like as an aside, a way to make small talk. That's probably a better way to start with it versus feeling like you have to tell this story that's going to create this big change. It's, it's a way to just sow a seed. And I may do that three or four times through their care before going, okay, now that you're feeling better, in your case, maintenance care would be an option. Let's have a discussion. Um, so I try just doing it as like an almost like informal throwaway first. That will help to build the muscle in the I guess actually, as you just said that, I thought, how many times do we say as colleagues to each other, oh, I had this patient who did this and I did this. And so maybe trying to say it as if you were talking to a colleague yeah, rather than to a patient yeah, that might be. Or it could be, here's something my colleague saw recently. Like if you're fairly new in practice, you don't have a lot of stories, ask, you, ask your colleagues, you know, what, what sort of interesting story they have, what golfers have they seen, whatever it might be. And you can go, yeah, a good friend of mine, a colleague of mine saw somebody like that earlier. The story doesn't have to be your patient. It doesn't have to involve you at all. I told you that bedwetting story about a kid I'd never met. It doesn't actually have to be relevant to that in the same way. So yeah, a little kind of throwaway one like that can work a bit better than versus feeling like you're having to put the pressure on. And exactly like, oh, I saw this interesting thing today, like you would with a colleague. I, I did realize actually also as you're talking, I was like, I never use stories. I was like, actually, whenever I'm telling a friend about anything, we actually use a story in a way then, don't we? Yeah. How like if I if I want to recommend a product, then I go, well, what happened was is I did I had been doing this and then I did this. And that's how we generally talk. But I think maybe we don't, we're not conscious that we're doing the story because it's so ingrained in what we do when we talk. Yeah, that I mean that's what people do. You gather people around a campfire, they'll tell stories all night. Like no one has to tell them this is what you're supposed to do. That's just what we do. But we get into professional mode and we start thinking, oh, I'm supposed to fill a certain role. I'm supposed to do it a certain way. I'm supposed to give them facts because I'm an expert. And we forget that actually just that that human to human interaction, it's almost always telling story. I wouldn't recommend a product to you because I went, oh yeah, I found this product and it's like 93% this and this is like, I wouldn't do that. I go, yeah, we started using this thing. It's great. It's really helped with da 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 That would be much more engaging than me going through the technical specifics of it. Yeah, it's, um, and I guess, do, do you think maybe there is a bit of a worry about dropping the technical out? Because like when you train, you're told to do, and this is the disc and this is the thing, which actually I think a lot of us tend to drop as we go along. But do you think if you're like newer at this and the, the there'd be a slight worry about dropping the technical, but I guess you just customise it to the patient, do you? Or Yeah, I mean, I, you don't have to drop the technical. Some patients will want that. It's, you'll always know because they'll ask you. Like, so what's actually happening? Like, you know, when you do that, what are you actually doing? And then I'm like, great, I'll put my teaching hat on and I'll get a model out or I'll sketch a diagram. I'll usually show one on the screen because my art skills are awful. Um, but it's then I'll go, great, here's an opportunity to impart some fact-based knowledge because they've asked for it. Um, I don't think you need to drop it at all. We still should be educating our patients. I don't only use stories, but I would start with a story because that's going to get the emotional brain interested. And then when they're interested, they're open to learning. It actually improves their learning as well because curiosity, you get greater, greater neuroplasticity with it. It's actually, I think it's something like seven times easier to learn a skill if you're curious versus you're not curious, you're just doing it because you've been told to. Um, so then when you bring in the technical side of things, they'll learn it and remember it much better. You'll still have to repeat it. Like there's, there's no way of telling somebody all the anatomical stuff that we remember it day one. Um, but I would start with the story and then bring that in afterwards as a supplement to the story. 
How do you explain Helen Justin works? Do we want to do that one in a panel one? That would be a better oh, panel. That's a really good one for the panel, actually. Yeah. <laughs> my version, but I wouldn't say this is how everyone should do it. Um, I think we can all explain that. Perfect. Well. We'll do that on the panel then. X is a yeah. good one for the panel. So you will, and you will get the, the recording will be available for you, Kevin. I promise on that.